welcome to the Journey of an Estate podcast, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, humanities, and what it means to be human. Pendleton. Yes. Austin Pendleton, this is Mitch Hampton, and you're on Hi. you're on Journey of an Esthete, my podcast, right now. Oh, great, great, wonderful. Um, wonderful. I'm going to have to say a couple of words about you before we start the discussion, if, sure. only, if only because I'm I feel so excited to talk with you, and oh. I, I I really seriously think you're one of the great artists, actually, in any medium. So we're not just talking about just acting, but but just just extraordinary comp- contribution to to theater as well as film and television, all three fields, and as well as playwriting and directing, and in, in addition to all that, educating. You are you are uh, an educator of of actors and acting. So my show is about basically having people guests talk about what's really important to them. What matters mm-hmm. to them, whatever it may be, yes. and in this yeah. ca- in this case, we're going to talk about these these matters. So, I typically want so welcome to our show. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I typically do things in a linear chronology. So, um, uh-huh. so what I'm looking at now is a picture of you in the rock musical, The Sweet Days of Isaac, 1970. Oh yeah, the last Sweet Days of Isaac. Yeah. yeah I'm looking at a picture of you, and that's Gretchen Ford and Nancy Cryer. Am I right? Uh, uh, Gretchen Cryer and Nancy Ford. Nancy Ford. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just yeah. that's going back in time. But but uh, if you yeah. want to start from the real beginning, you hail from the Midwest, correct, Ohio? That's right. That's right. Did you want to talk about whatever comes into your mind about a Midwestern boyhood, or or uh, uh, whatever comes to your mind about that about that experience of going from that to? Deciding you're going to be an actor or want to be an actor or a performer. Sure, I'd love to talk about. I'd love to talk about anything you want to talk about. Okay, so you you hail from the Midwest, I guess Ohio, right? Yes, that's right. I grew up in Warren, Ohio. Uh huh. Yeah, and um, and and uh, and my mom had um, had been a professional actress and director. She was at the Cleveland Playhouse. Oh wow! And and I, I'm I'm the oldest of three of of, of of their three children, and I um and so she'd been but she'd been a pro, she'd been a professional actress and director, and my father saw her in a play at the Cleveland Playhouse and was introduced to her wow. through mutual friends, and then um the um uh uh and then what then what happened was um. After the war, uh, when I was six or seven years old at that point, no, I, no, I was younger than that. Some people in Warren, Ohio, after the war, maybe a couple years after, um, we're talking about World War II, <coughs> uh, came to her and said they wanted to start a community theater. Wow. And, when, and they came to her for um, advice. They got a lot more than advice from her. She became part of the group, and she acted there, and she directed there. And a lot of the early plays that they did were rehearsed in our living room, you know, after dinner. Wow. And, and, and my brother and I, our sister was then only two. Our sister, with whom I'm staying now in Boston, was only two years old. But, but my brother and I would sneak down and watch the rehearsals. We we were supposed to be in bed, hmm. and it was just so so exciting having all those people come over. They'd come over after dinner, like eight o'clock or something, and rehearse for three hours or so. Wow! And I I just remember being so excited by that, and I think that's probably <clears throat> when I got bitten by the bug. Mm-hmm. And um, the um, then also. Those were the years in the mid mid nineteen forties when every year or two a whole new touring company of the musical Oklahoma would come out and come to Cleveland. Huh. 
and and we I was taken to see Oklahoma, and there were always evening shows out like enough up in Cleveland, which is about an hour away mm-hmm. from one. And uh, I be, I desperately wanted to be in Oklahoma, huh. which of course, of course never happened. <laughs> but between Oklahoma and then those rehearsals of the community theater, this is now the late nineteen forties. Uh, in the evenings, I I just got totally obsessed with being an actor. Yeah. Well, it's it sounds like you really knew had almost a calling early on. You knew what you wanted to do, and, yeah, and you believed okay. in something. And I, I I really I can't help but think that that, um, I guess set the stage, pun intended or not pun intended, for yes. uh, your, your for your great because I have a list here of, of projects you are a part of that I consider immensely important. And I don't want to jump to, I mean, of course, we have to talk a little bit about um, Uta Hagen yes. and HB Studios. It's very important that the listeners, anything you have to say about it, but we can hold that. But if you were in, so for example, in the 60s, you worked with the great Michael Ritchie, correct? The great, what, the, uh, the uh, who? The director, Michael Ritchie. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, um that wasn't in the 60s. I, I, I met him just, oh, I didn't meet him until, uh, <clears throat> wow, um, uh, the mid-90s. Oh, okay. I mean, I knew him slightly before that, but it was at that point that he took over the, uh, he took over the Williamstown Theater Festival. No, but I, but I was, the reason why I thought that was the case is you and Arthur Coppett's play, Old Dad, Poor yes. Dad. And yeah. I, I had thought that Richie was the director on that, but maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken. Oh no, Jerome Robbins. Oh, Jerome yeah. Robbins. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And then I said the first two shows I was in in New York were directed by um, uh, uh, Jerome Robbins. The first was the Arthur uh, Cobb play. You're saying, um, "Oh, Dad, poor Dad, Mama's hung you in the closet. I'm feeling so sad." And the next one I did for him. So, so that was my first show in New York. That was an off-Broadway show. And mm-hmm. the next big show I did in New York was a Broadway show, and that was Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. So I direct. I I worked with him two times wow. in a in a row, essentially. That's really and, incredible. So you're you're so you actually realized your dream of being in musicals. Obviously, you're in Fiddler, and you're doing yeah. you're in one of the early groundbreaking rock musicals. And uh, so you're, you're actually doing what you set out to do, at least in part, when it comes to musicals. But I, I want to yeah. backtrack a little bit and talk about the importance of, of Uta Hagen and your training and how you came uh, to, to that world and, her, and her, what was special about her and what she meant to you and meant to other people, if, if you don't mind going back in Sure. Um, well, when I was in Oh, Dad, Poor Dad, uh, which I, I got that part virtually by a fluke. What um, I'll, I'll call I'll call him Jerry Robbins because uh, that's what people call him who knew him. But but Jerome Robbins, his previous credits have been things like like uh, West, Side West Side Story mm-hmm. and, and Gypsy and so forth. Yeah. He conceived West Side Story. It was all his idea. Mm-hmm. That's right. West Side Story. And but anyway, so um, I I read Oh Dad Poor Daddy. It had been done at Harvard when yeah. Arthur Coppett was a, was an undergraduate there, and it was all written up in the papers. And well, first of all, you, uh, it was a title that sort of that had stuck. I mean, if you see that title, you remember that title. Yeah. You know? yeah. And um, so my senior year in college, I, at that point in Grand Central, they had a bookstore, and one one day I was returning up to Yale. I was an undergraduate at Yale. And I went in the bookstore, and there was a copy of Odette Porter that I'd heard about. I didn't know anything about it. So I thought, I'll read it on the train. Huh. Then I remember thinking, well, you know, and I'd heard it was going to come to New York. And I was about to be in New York, because this, this was my senior year in, uh, in college. Um, I read the play, and I thought sort of almost cold-bloodedly, if I could get an audition for this part, I would get the part. Wow. And uh, 
it wasn't even that I wanted the part that, that way, but I wanted the job. Sure, of course. And, and I thought I would, yeah. I would get, and I thought it was a remarkable play. It's a wonderful play. It's really wonderful. Yeah, yeah. and so then, um, but then I learned yeah. just a couple of weeks after that, it was announced that it was coming to New York the following season, and they had they had a cast and a director and everything. So I thought, well, okay, that's okay. That's all right. So I'm not going to get that part. So then after I graduated about a month later, me and my brother, Alec, and, and a, a friend of ours from Ohio, Tom Schroeder, uh, we all went over to England and then we spent the summer just kind of knocking around first England and then Europe. When we got to London, we saw in the paper that up in Cambridge, England, Oh Dad, Poor Dad, that production that was coming to New York, was trying out in Cambridge, England, and that it was about to come to it was about to come to London, and then it would go to to New York. So we said, let's go up to Cambridge and see it. I said, I read this play; it has a part of it. I would like to play, but clearly I'm not going to play it. And um, but but I'm just curious to see it. So you know who Stella Adler was? She was one of the great acting. Teachers. Yes, I, I very, I very much know. See, I, I should, I should interject here that my father had a theater company in the eighties in Florida, and one of the yeah. first, one of one of the first productions he did was your Orson Shadow. He loved oh your, my God. he loved your play Orson Shadow, and my and my oh. father put on that play, and I remember having long discussions with him about about the virtues of that play. I just thought I'd put the, uh, Aubrey, Aubrey Hampton that interesting, so. Things are well, that all. Might, that's wonderful. I'm so wonderful to hear. Really, I'm so grateful that that happened. So the um, so we went up to Cambridge and saw Oh Dad, Poor Dad, and the part that I thought I should have played was played by this brilliant young English actor named Andrew Ray, mm -hmm. who I had just seen. He'd been a child star in English movies, and now he was twenty or something, and he was. Uh, 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 he was extraordinary. I've just seen him on Broadway in A, a Taste of Honey a few yeah. months before, and now he was in Odette Poor Dad in Cambridge, England. And and I, he was extraordinary. He only played it a very short time because it closed in London. It didn't ever come to New York. Hmm. He, and But in the whole year I played Odette Poor Dad, I really don't think I ever quite hit what he got in the part. Interesting. He, he, had, he had something extraordinary in that role. And Stella Adler was, of course, a great actress. Oh, she yeah. Was, and that was the last play she ever did. After that play flopped in London, she talked for the rest of her life, but she would never, ever act in a play again. So I don't know, I don't know what happened before they got to London, but, the, but those two actors in particular had something really strong going. So, but still, I forgot about it. Why well, the only reason? And, um, yeah. and uh, so, so the play isn't going to come to New York. But wow. Then, okay. Well, that's too bad because they really had something there. And the um, then I, I was in Europe all summer, and I got back to New York in September, and that's when I began to live in New York with a whole bunch of roommates, hmm. friends I knew from college, friends I knew from from Warren, Ohio, all in this big sprawling apartment on the west side mm. on the west side and I read in the New York Times magazine there was an article about Gerald Robbins saying he was going to direct Odette Pordat mm. and they were starting from scratch with the cast so I I went to agents offices and I said I said can I get and they didn't know who I was and they said uh, and I said I would like to audition for Odette Pordat I said, and they would, and they were very polite, I must say. But they would politely say, uh, "Who are you? Huh. What have you done?" And I'd say, mm -hmm. "Oh, I acted in plays in college." And, you know, they say, "This is a leading role in a Jerome Robbins production. We can't send somebody up who basically has no real professional experience." So I would say, "Okay." And so I sort of forgot about it. Hmm. Then one day I got a call from an actress friend of mine who had been an apprentice with me at, at the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts. And, and uh, she called me, and she'd gotten an agent. She said, I was, I was gossiping with my agent today, and she happened to mention that 
that Jerry Robbins can't find the actor he would like to play the boy in Odette Pordat. And she said, so I mentioned your name. And I got all excited. And she, she said four of the greatest words I've ever heard. This is an actress by the name of Nancy Donahue. Wow. Since this died. But um, she, she said, no, Austin, she said, she said, don't have the part. Because I was clearly sounding like, oh, I'm going to meet your agent. Your agent's going to send me up, Rodette. And Jerry Roberts is going to hire me. I mean, I was already projecting all that. But she said, don't have the part, which are four of the wisest words about emotional survival in this profession I've ever heard. Hmm. Don't assume you have something or that you're going to be able to keep something until it happens. Hmm. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, so I went in, I met her agent. Her agent said, well, you look right for it. And got me in play with the casting director. The casting director was, had that exhausted look of, that came over people who were casting shows for Jerry Robbins. Because hmm. he, he, he was, he was, you know, one of the great artists of the, 20th century, yeah, clearly. Sitting in the musical theater. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, he's still yeah. the greatest of that. Yep. And, and uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, he, I, mean, I mean, he died quite a few years ago, but he, yeah. he was the one everybody else looked up to. Yeah. But he was wildly indecisive about casting. Huh. So the, Interesting. So the casting director was looking just exhausted. She said, well, well, okay, you go in next Tuesday. So I went in next Tuesday, and he was... He was very happy and surprised because he had no idea who I was. That's fantastic. And, um, so, but I had to audition for him six times. Six times, wow. Yeah, wow. which was which was typical. In fact, they now have a what's informally called the Jerry Robbins rule. I don't know <laughs> if, if you if you ask somebody to do it, you have to pay somebody for any auditions after three auditions for the same part. You have to start to pay them that just simply to audition. Um, because, uh, so I auditioned for him about six times and my auditions kept getting worse and worse and worse. Hmm. Uh, because I, I, I never heard of a callback before. <laughs> I thought you, you, you went in and you, you auditioned once and you either got the part or not. Right. And so I was getting more and more self-conscious. I mean, and so, and he would, he called me to his apartment one day and said, now what's happening? I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing. That's, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and he, but he would be encouraging. He would get, well, they didn't get worse and worse. The second audition was astoundingly worse than the first one was. And then they gradually improved, but not much. And I went home for Christmas. Mm. And I thought, okay, this is, so this isn't good. This isn't going to happen. It doesn't really, I mean, you know, I've, I've at least attracted the attention of an agent, so I'll, you know something good is going to come. I sort of said, I sort of said goodbye to it. <coughs> then, <coughs> the day after Christmas, mm -hmm. I get a call from the agency that had submitted me. The agent was a woman by the name of Deborah Coleman, who then became my agent until she retired many years later. Mm -hmm. But anyway, from I got from that agency saying. Say so Jerry Robbins wants you to come in and audition tomorrow again for Odette. And I said, I just, there's no point to this. I, 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 I've lost whatever I had in the part. I don't, that I showed in the first audition, I can't seem to get it back. It's getting embarrassing. Just to tell him I appreciate it, but no, I don't think. She said, I'm not going to call Jerome Robbins and tell him you would rather stay in Ohio than come back. <laughs> I'm just not going to do that. Right. You get in here tomorrow. That's beautiful. So that is beautiful. I flew in that night. Wow. Huh. And I went to my apartment that I had with all these other people. And then I went in the next day. Mm. And there was Barbara Harris. Oh, you know. Barbara and Harris. Just, oh, my goodness. What a, what a wonderful actress. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. And she had heard of her. I'd heard yeah. of her. She just come in and done a show with that Chicago group called The Second City, an mm -hmm. improv group. And I, I'd heard that she was terrific. Mm. Well, she and I started to read, and it took off. Mm. And we both got the parts that, that morning. Wow. And then we went into rehearsal two weeks later. 
But I, it, so in other words, essentially, I got that role because of Barbara Harris. Oh wow! We 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 had an instant sort of a chemistry, and uh, she was, of course, a wonderful artist. <clears throat> and then the play opened to to mixed reviews. Mm-hmm. But then two weeks after it opened, it was announced that the two giants of the musical theater who had never written a musical together before. Alan J. Lerner and Richard Rogers mm. were going to write a show together. Whoa. So now they, they didn't know what the show was going to be, but it was going to be written for Barbara Harris. So we ran for a year on the strength of that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody wanted to see Barbara Harris. And also that fantastic actress was in it. Uh, Joe Van Fleet. Oh, wow. So we, so we ran for a year. It became a very popular show. Yeah. <clears throat> what what drew people to see it was who is this who is this Barbara Harris? They wanted hmm. who, who these fantastic. As it happened, that musical, um, I think I think Richard Rogers after a while decided not to work on it. But Alan hmm. Jaylen called it Bird Lane, and they it, they called it On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. Yeah. So yep. that was written for Barbara Harris as a result of that's right. Uh, of Alan J. Lerner having seen Oh Dad, Poor Dad. So that was a fluke surprise. I mean, the fact that I got the part was a fluke. It's it's, remar- that- it's remarkable. I mean, well, one of the remarkable things, of course, is that's such a terrific musical, the Burton Lang. Uh, oh, people yeah, people, yeah, asso- yes, people associate show. that with um, Barbara Streisand and Eve Montan in the film version. But yeah. Barbara Harris uh, is... it's um, but I'm a little. I'm. A, I want to kind of get the chronology here. So you're saying that you had met Stella Adler before Uta Hagen, or no? I I didn't meet Stella Adler ever. I, I mean, oh. years and years later, very very briefly. Oh, okay. I was introduced to her, but I I I mean, I didn't go backstage in Cambridge, England, because I didn't yeah. know anybody. Right. I, I mean, I knew who Stella Adler was. Right. And I and I'd seen Andrew Ray just a few months before in A Taste of Hunting on Broadway. But I didn't know, I didn't know anybody in the professional theater really then. Yeah. So I, 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 my brother and our friend didn't go back stage or anything like that. So, uh, but, uh, um, so, um, um, I think Jerry Robbins, even when he was casting it for New York, he did. I, he told me approach Stella Adler to do it. She said, "I'm not going near that play again mm. because it was a, a flop for her in London. In fact, she never acted in the theater again after that. She taught mm. quite spectacularly for a long, long time. Mm. But and I met her once, just once mm. at a party. And um, the uh, um, but uh, so I had but so then. Then, okay, so this leads to Uta Hagen. Uh, after a while in Old Dad, I began to have real trouble maintaining the performance. Because it was eight, it was off Broadway, it was eight performances a week. That's, and, that's tough. And, uh, that's a tough, that's very uh, And I didn't, I've never been in a play more than mm. maybe eight or nine times. <laughs> mm-hmm. Eight or nine performances, you know, like in college or something like that. <clears throat> so I had, and quite soon into ODAT, I, I I sort of didn't know what I was doing. It was getting worse and worse. So I wanted to quit the show. Hmm. And Jerry Robbins called me up and invited me to, to, to stop by his place on the way to the show. And he said, uh, I can't keep you from quitting. It's an off-Broadway contract. And you have a two-week out. But I really don't want you to quit. And I said, Jerry, I think you don't know how bad it gets sometimes. He said, yeah, I do. We have a thing called a performance report. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, they report in the performance reports. Mm. And, wow. and again, I'd never heard of a performance report. Uh, that, and oh, this, this is humiliating. Mm. He said, I just, I want you to tough this out or you will never act again. Mm-hmm. And I want you to act the rest of your life. So yeah, wow. I, so that, that gave me, that gave me, uh, you know, a shot in the arm. Sure. And then I, uh, then, but then I, my performance began to fall apart again. 
Huh. So I, I said to one of the other actors in Oh Dad, Poor Dad, uh, a good friend of mine by the name by the name of Barry Primus. Who oh, up. wow. Another good friend. Yeah. yeah. He's a wonderful I said, Another I don't know what to do, Barry. Jerry Robbins wants me to stay in the show, <laughs> and I'm falling apart in it again. He said, and his answer to that was to give me subway directions down to audition for Uta Hagen. Whoa. He, I said, what? I, I, he said, I said, I don't know what to do. He said, I'll tell you what you do. Wow. You take the number one, two, or three train. I mean, yeah. he said, I said, I'm not asking for subway directions somewhere. I want to know what. He said, I'm telling you what to do. And so I started to study with Uta Hagen. Wow. Well, Barry Primus, up, that's remarkable. Up, and then I ended yeah. up, up teaching there. That's that right. You, a, that's right. That was a that was an important subway ride in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, for, yeah. for audiences who you know don't know a lot about acting or any of these things, if you had to uh, say any words about Uta Hagen, what was unique or special about what she gave um, students? What, what what comes to mind? I know that's a big topic, but. I'm just sort of well. She she had that thing that all the all the all the really great teachers have, and which all the really good directors, as a matter of fact, have, which is a combination of kind and and tough, tough mm. and kind, mm. all at the same time. I mean, she uh, she was very demanding in the quality and how how well if you brought in a scene for her class and, and she saw evidence that you hadn't put any serious work into it, she would be firm about that. She mm -hmm. would say some version of saying, look, you're either serious about this or you're not. And if you're not, you're just sort of in the way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, she would, she would speak with great humor and she could be very supportive. If she felt you were really doing the work, even if it if it wasn't coming together, but she could tell you to put in a lot of work. Then she got very supportive and very specific about how to work on it. And then you would and then you would be expected to bring in the following week what she called called a rework of it. Hmm. And then she would she would take note to you <clears throat> where you had progressed and where you hadn't. She was very practical. Her, her te the techniques she taught were are very very practical. And they're all outlined in her books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because when I think of you, I can't ever imagine you getting worse or doing giving a bad performance. I mean, I have to say, you're one of the most consistent actors I know, and and just prolific and consistent. So she she must have gleaned something from her to to, to get that get that proficiency. Well, I mean, because I'm I'm looking on my list here. I mean, some of the you work with the best. So just to name two, Billy Wilder in the front page. Oh yeah. Yeah, and totally. and Alan J. Pakula and starting over with Burt Reynolds and Joe Clayberg and, and I mean just those two movies alone, um, you know if he had done nothing else that's a so I don't want to get too far ahead but I mean you've worked with some really uh, I'm just curious your anything you have to say about either Billy Wilder or Alan J. Pakula or well, Mike, or both, Mike Nichols they were both great but but before I say anything about either of them. Um, acting, and there are exceptions to this. Everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. For most actors, acting is a thing. It's, it, it's like anything else. It's a craft you have to learn. Now, when I was in college, I got a lot of great parts. And, um, and, I, and, I, and, and, I, and I did well in them. But... Um, you have to have more than talent. You have to develop a craft of how to keep something alive over a period of time and mm -hmm. how to sustain and how to work on a variety of roles. Mm 
because mm-hmm. because the because the roles I did when I was in college were I mean they were they were great very great roles but they were within a certain kind of range you know mm-hmm. and you can't do that all your life or you wouldn't get that much work you know yeah. and and also you don't you you have to you have to know how to the main thing you have to learn is you have to have to find something that really works and then learn how to always have it there for you in the role, how to sustain it. And, um, um, and when you're in a play in, in college, as I say, you play it maybe six, seven, eight times. And, and that's easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's, but, but that doesn't, um, uh, a demand of constantly keeping it going for months and months at a time. Or if you're making a film, sustaining it for 22 takes, you know, and all that kind of thing. Um, you need to learn, so you need a technique. Mm-hmm. And, and Uda certainly taught a technique, as did her husband, Herbert Berghoff. Oh, had, yeah, Herbert. Begun- who, who, who had begun the studio, and I studied with him too. And he was the one who then asked me to start to teach there. So was her, so Herbert, right now, I'm sorry, so it was right, Herbert Bergdorf that got you teaching, actually. Yeah, right now yeah. is the, the 50th anniversary of when I started teaching there. And um, the um, and then, um, oh my God, no, it's the six, no, it's, it, it, it's the 50th. I began to teach mm-hmm. there in the late 60s. And they and um, so um, to, to, audiences might not know Herbert Bergdorf, Herbert HB Studios, and Herbert uh, Bergdorf. Um, Bergdorf. Uh, I just recently watched his performance in Harry and Tonto. Oh yes, remember Car- remember about uh, Art Carney's friend and Paul Mazursky's Harry and Tonto. He's in oh, that. Yeah, totally. yeah. That's yeah a- he's in a lot of films. And it, and B E. R G H O F Herbert Berghoff. Berghoff. Is, that's is, right. Yeah, and he he was he was Uda's husband. That's right. And and he got her teaching. She never had any idea of teaching, and he had an instinct. Uh, this is after they were married and mm-hmm. everything. He said, "You can I use you start teaching?" Mm-hmm. She said, "Well, I'll give it a shot." And then <laughs> she became one of the legendary teachers and actresses, by the way. Oh yeah. And um, uh, um, but anyway, so um. Um, but, uh, so, uh, it was 12 years after I first started acting in the theater that I worked with Billy Wilder and he was, uh, he was lovable. He was, um, he knew exactly what he wanted and he was very funny and witty, and, but, but gently stern about, he would keep, he, he would keep, he, he would keep doing the same. Uh, I, I mean, you would do a few takes, and he would sort of gently keep after you, hmm. and until he got what he wanted. And uh, he was patient and demanding, hmm. and and funny. He was very funny. And hmm. um, now Alan Pakula was quite unique. Oh yeah. He he and I I auditioned. No, I auditioned for him. Mm-hmm. I um, um, I was in the Muppet movie. That's right. And all That's my right. scenes were with Charlie Durning. Oh who wow! I, who I'd met years before when I was in Fiddler on the Roof. He had a part in it, and then his then they cut his role yeah. out of the show. So I mean, they so he had to go because they <laughs> because they took out the role mm-hmm. he was playing. And uh, so I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm but, guessing Charles Journey was the Burt Reynolds connection because they were so right. So, yeah, well, should, yeah. so what happened was I was so, so I was with Charlie in, in the Muppet movie, mm-hmm. and all our scenes were together really because I played his chauffeur. And, and then I called him from the Los Angeles airport when I was on the way back to New York after we got through with the Muppet movie. And I said, it was great working with you and getting to know you again and all that. And he said, yeah, you know, I'm about to be in this Alan Pakula movie. You should, when you get back to New York, you should tell your agent to, to get you an audition for it. Yeah. If I hadn't been in the Muppet movie, I never would have been in Starting Over. Wow. So I did. I told my agent and she called him. 
Alan Pakula. And of course, <clears throat> so I auditioned for him and then he called me back. <clears throat> he said, but he told my agent I should come by his office at the end of the day. The end of the day means they also want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So I went and I saw him. He said, now, why do you want to be in this movie? Mm. <laughs> and I said, well, it's, I mean, this is a job, but no, he said, why do you really want to be in this movie? It's sort of an unusual part for you. And I said, uh, in, in what way unusual? He said, well, you play these really eccentric, this is just a person in regular life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why would you want to play this? I said, well, first of all, I said, it is, that's part of the reason I'd like to play it. Exactly. Not like other parts <laughs> exactly. That's exactly the but point. The, point. But then the other thing I said was, and to be perfectly frank, I said, All the President's Men, which was a film he'd made oh, yeah. two years before or something. Yeah. I said, All the President's Men has more good performances in it than any movie I've ever seen. That's true. And I, I want to know wow. how you do it. Oh, wow. And it said, uh, <coughs> so I'm being totally frank here. Yeah. I want to work with you. I want to see how you get the kind of work you get. Yeah. Wow. So he cast me. Oh, wow. And then, um, and he does, he does, did many, 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 many takes. Oh, that's interesting. I did not know that. Was he, and, was and he known for that? Or was that kind of just his, the way he worked? In particular, that, 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 that was the way he worked. But what he would do, and I've never exactly seen this with any director in stage or film, or he, every take he gave you a whole new way of playing it. Huh. Every take. He, I mean, after the first take, he'd go cut at the end of, this, of the take, you know. Huh. Then he would say, okay, we have it that way. Now why don't you try? Without changing a word of the script. And this would go on and on and wow. on. And and there was one scene that I had where I, it's basically a speech I'm giving to Burt Reynolds. Mm -hmm. And um, he, um, so every time, and I think we did 21 takes. Mm. And then um, he, uh, and they said, okay, let's, okay, now we'll turn around. We just need one take of a close-up of Bert reacting to you. Mm -hmm. So I was off camera, and we did that take. And then Alan Kukul said, oh, my God, Austin. <coughs> yeah. You found it. You really found it on this take. Of course, this is the take where I'm off camera. But it, it was the end of the day. Hmm. So I went out that I, I, was, I directed a play that was in previews. And uh, because I, uh, I hadn't known when I undertook to direct that play that I'd be doing this movie, uh, all, all of this was in New York. And I, um, so I, I was just, I was in despair. I thought, I finally got something he wanted, but I was off camera. And now he has to move on. Mm. <clears throat> so the next, early the next morning, I come down and, wow. and, and uh, 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 to work on other scenes. At seven in the morning, and I'm hungover, and he's, and he says, uh, "You really hit something off camera uh, at the end of the day uh, when we when we completed last night." So I want I want to give you one more take, and I want to see that on camera. And of course, I had no idea what I'd done. Mm. And uh, so uh, he said, "Now we're going to hurry you through hair and makeup." And uh, and then we'll just have one shot, one take of, and and I'd like to see some of what I saw, what I saw at the end of the day yesterday. And I thought, did, I did, I did, I, first of all, I'm so hungover because I got so drunk the night before after, with the actors of the play that I directed after mm -hmm. the show that uh, <coughs> I could, I was hungover, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it was I did. <laughs> well. So yeah, he shot that one take, and he said, "That's it. That's it. We got it." Yeah, of course. Now to this day, I don't know what take he used. Yeah, he might have used the third take from the day before. But what he did, he liked to, and he was a very, he was a very soft-spoken man, very thoughtful, and all of that. <laughs> and he was thoughtful.
powerful and and, and sensitive, you know. And he, um, but he liked to. Well, what happened with me, and I think that other actors had the same experience. He um, he got you so that you didn't know what you were doing, mm. and then and then he um, he thought that would bring out really truthful behavior mm-hmm. that you were just spontaneously mm. <clears throat> because you you'd been given a different choice to play on every single take. Yeah. They all began to blur together. So he had this, and that way of working was very peculiar to him. Mm-hmm. And his, um, you can see it in the acting in his films. Oh, yeah. Everybody looks very excitingly lost, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. So that was the Pekulex. And then I, I saw him, you know, a few other times over the, you know, over his life. And uh, in fact, I saw him three weeks before he died, we were at, a, at the birthday party for, for a mutual friend, and we had a nice long talk. Mm. And he was preparing this screenplay about FDR and Eleanor. Yeah. <coughs> and, and I said, um, I said, is Meryl going to be in it? Because, <coughs> mm-hmm. of course, she and he had worked so well on Sophie's Choice together. Oh, yeah. And, um, uh, and, and in the meantime, I'd done a play with her in Central Park. Um, and I said, I, I said, uh, I said, um, who's, um, um, who, I, I said, who's going to play Eleanor? Is, would that be Meryl? And he said, well, I'm going to try to persuade Meryl to play both Eleanor and FDR. <laughs> hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> Which was which was funny yeah. because it, it, it was a joke around the fact that she can apparently do almost anything mm-hmm. as an actor. She's extraordinary, of course, yeah. and, and very generous, by the way. I, ha- I have to ask, uh, did you know John Cazale? Oh, yeah, I was in a play with him mm. um, at the Longworth, the, the, the Eugene O'Neill play, The Iceman Cut. Wow. Yeah, huh. it was... He was a he was remarkable. Yeah, that was tragic. Mm. Really tragic. Yeah, I, I have. I, it's the Christmas season, so I, I think I should uh, ask you a little bit about Scrooge and playing Scrooge. Well, you know, it's so funny. Uh, I was approached by Laurie, you know, who's who had been in my class and who's who's got quite a range as an actress. Mm-hmm. And somehow, to my surprise, she was obsessed with the Christmas Carol. And she wanted me to play Scrooge, mm-hmm. and I, I never have liked that story. I, 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 it's, that story has never meant anything to me. Huh. Christmas Carol, and I thought, but still, Scrooge. <coughs> I like Laurie so much, and Scrooge. You know, I mean, Scrooge. I guess that's an interesting. To try to find a character like that. Okay, but I, but I've always thought. I mean. There's a lot of Dickens that I really like a lot, mm-hmm. but I just was not. And a book right now, I'm in the Oliver Twist uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, thing um, of, of the musical Oliver. Oh, you're doing it? Uh, okay, excellent. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here in right Boston. Right, the second in Boston, yeah. But um, the um, um, but I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And then when I began working on it as an actor, with Laurie, you know, at the helm, um, I said, that way, I've been wrong about this piece all my life. Mm-hmm. This piece is profound. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. Yeah, I've sort of, I've been, I've been giving it a bad rap. And, um, the, um, so, um, <coughs> excuse me, I have coffee. Yeah, well, it's time of year. I, I do <coughs> So you can drink a water. And, yeah, yeah. That, no, that's fine. So, so, I'm, so then we, for 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 quite a while, we've been doing it annually. Yes. And it's um, and I love it. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a great role. I mean, it's a mm-hmm. profound role. Yeah. It's it's a um the way that he the the way that Dickens, the way he leads you through that journey. With the with the different ones of the ghosts and, and it's utterly convincing. 
Mm-hmm. And it and and so it's. Uh, I can't think of a character in any work that goes through a change quite like that. And 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 so and the production lawyer was putting it was so well done that I found that I was believing it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, now I'm catching up with the rest of the world. The rest of the world has believed it ever since it was written. And I, for some reason, had this resistance to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, and now I'm, I'm devoted to it. I, I'm happy that you are because you're, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's one of your great roles in your career, yeah. I think. And I, and I, and I really feel that, you know, again, is that, that's probably not the first time you have you re- reevaluated a play or a film or, have there been other times when you started on one position and something changed in you or something? I mean, that's kind of an interesting when that happens, huh? Uh huh. Yeah. It, I I don't think I've ever so completely. I don't think I've ever worked on a part. See, see, see. Ordinarily, I accept a part is because I love the part. Right. Or. Or I need the money, or whatever. Yeah, straightforward you know. Yeah, right. But the, um, but here I only took it because of Lori, mm. and because I'd seen. I mean, I, I like her so much, and I've seen her work in class, and I think she's a real artist. And mm. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, why not? Yeah. And and I, yes, I'll, I'll be right there. And so it uh, it was an annual. Uh, I didn't know it was going to turn into an annual event, mm-hmm. and I remember. I, I don't think I've ever done such a 180 mm-hmm. on, a, on a roll as I have done with that. And, and it, it, the way it yields to you when you're playing it, it's, it's, it's so, there's so much there in the writing. I, I have to go in a couple of minutes. <laughs> I understand that, Austin. Um, Austin, you know, um, I know that you have to go. And I know because you're in between shows, right? You, you have to go on. I think you have to go on, right? Yeah, um, well, well uh, today some of the people <clears throat> involved in the, in this production of Oliver that I'm in here at yeah. New Rep, uh, uh, they teach over uh, at, at one of the conservatories, and they wanted me to come and teach this afternoon there. So I'm being picked up now to go and do that. And um, the um, um, I can talk to you again sometime if you want. We can make. I would I would love to because we've only just scratched the surface. We haven't talked about Chekhov and. You're you're oh. you're directing Chekhov and Tennessee Williams, and there's just yes. a, there's a lot there's a lot to talk about. But I am so honored. This has been a this has been quite an hour, uh, and I really I really appreciate immensely your time in talking about these things that really matter. Um, yeah. I just I couldn't I can't begin to thank you enough. So um, well, thank you too. I I I'm really enjoying this. So so let's by email let's you you can get my email from from. Thank you.